This is part two of the introduction to vectors. In this video, we're going to be a lot more quantitative in our analysis of direction and magnitude, and we're going to look at what we might call the polar form of a vector. So first, a definition. Given a vector u with components a and b, we define the so-called norm of u and as the quantity square root of a squared plus b squared. And we use this symbol with, it looks like a double barred absolute value. And so a few comments about this gadget. Because a squared plus b squared is never negative, there's no trouble with calculating the square root. So the, the norm of u is defined for every vector. And because you're taking the square root, it's guaranteed to be non-negative. And in fact, the only way it could be zero is if you started with the zero vector, in which case both components a and b would be zero. Otherwise, you have to get a positive norm. And if you simply look at a vector in the plane situated with the tail at the origin, you realize that the norm of u is actually giving you the magnitude of u. It's a simple application of the Pythagorean theorem because you have a right triangle with sides that are equal to a and b in this case, and so the hypotenuse, or the magnitude of the vector, is simply the norm. So you can calculate norms of vectors rather easily by applying this rule. So here are four simple examples which you can look at. And this, this is just brute force. You just crank them out using the definition, and that's fine. But there are certain cases where you want to be a little more sophisticated. And a property that really helps is this one. For all real numbers k and vectors u, when you take the norm of the scaled vector k u, you get the absolute value k times the norm of u. So what is this really saying? Just intuitively, when you scale a vector by a number k, the length is multiplied by absolute value of k. Why absolute value of k? Well, one way to think of it is if k is negative, then scaling by k involves some sort of flipping, but the flipping doesn't change the length, so the absolute value squashes that sign information, you don't have to worry about it. So let's look at an official proof of this. You could first of all write u in component form and then rewrite your expression and apply scalar multiplication and just crank out the definition using norm. So apply some algebra, square root of a product is the product of the square roots. And at this point, fun fact, the square root of k squared is actually the absolute value of k. And the expression on the right is precisely the norm of the original vector u. Lo and behold, there's the relationship we were looking for. Absolute value of k times the norm of u is equal to the original expression. So you should be willing and able to use this expression, this, this property. And here are a couple of examples how it could come in handy. You could take the norm of this vector. Now, you could just crank it out by brute force, and I suppose it's not that big a deal, but these are pretty big numbers, and if you don't have a calculator, you've got to deal with simplifying it, perhaps. There's a better way. You can recognize a common factor of 4, which you could pull out as a scalar factor, and then apply the principle, which that's a little too fancy. You could probably work this out in your head, and you realize that the answer is 4 square root of 13. So the property allows you to sort of get to a nice result, much cleaner. And in this case, you could, once again, you could just try to just crank out the norm, and you get this fractional expression under the radical. It just doesn't look like much fun. Perhaps the better thing to do is think about it this way. You could multiply by 6 to clear out the fractions on the inside, but of course you can't just multiply by 6, you're going to change the vector, so you have to balance that by multiplying by 1 over 6. So it looks like you haven't done anything net, but you have, because 6 times the components on the inside give you a nice vector with integer uh, components, and now it's easy to calculate the norm here. In fact, it's 5, it's a Pythagorean triple we're dealing with, and so the norm is 5, 6. Very nice. A unit vector is, by definition, a vector of magnitude 1. So u is a unit vector if and only if the norm is 1. So let's get a picture of what unit vectors really look like. If you took the unit circle and you placed a unit vector in the plane so that its tail is at the origin, then it would look like one of these vectors in this animation. Every unit vector has to look like that. 
So this has a consequence in terms of components. Let u be any unit vector, say this one. If we let theta denote the angle between the positive x-axis and the location of u, and, and we're measuring counterclockwise, we, we know from our study of trigonometry that the coordinates of that red point there are cosine theta, sine theta, and those would be the components of our vector. So every unit vector can be written in the form cosine theta, sine theta. That is handy to know. Yet another definition, normalization. The normalization of a vector is the unit vector that points in the same direction as u. And we often use the symbol u hat to denote the normalization. So let's take a look at some vectors in the plane and then their normalizations. So in this case, when we normalize u and w, we have to scale them some, somehow down to size because they're too large. To find the normalization of s, we have to scale it up because it's too small. And if v is already a unit vector, then the normalization is going to be the same vector. So clearly normalization involves some sort of scaling to get it to have magnitude 1. And the question is, is there an algorithm? Is there an automatic way to do this? And the answer is yes. It's not so hard. And the goal is to find this k that we would multiply by u so that the norm of the resulting vector is 1. So how does this work? Let's apply our principle to express the norm of ku as absolute value of k times the norm of u. And we'll solve for k by dividing through by the norm of u. And this looks like trouble because if u were the 0 vector, then its norm would be 0 and you'd be dividing by 0. But that's, that shouldn't be a problem because the zero vector has no direction, so there's really no point in trying to normalize it anyway. So we'll assume that u is not the zero vector. Now, absolute value of k being that quantity, we can take k equals plus or minus that quantity. But this expression on the right here, we don't want that guy because the norm of u is positive. It means that negative 1 over norm of u is negative, and we don't want to flip. We want the same direction, not the opposite direction. So let's ditch that possibility. And we're left with k is 1 over norm u, the reciprocal of the norm of u. And that is our algorithm. That's the way we normalize. We, we take the reciprocal of the norm and scale it by the original vector. That's our normalization. So let's revisit a couple of examples. We already calculated the norms of these two vectors, u and v. So by scaling by the reciprocal of the norm, we get the normalization. And we can clean this guy up a little bit to get that expression. And as for v, we multiply by the reciprocal of the norm. And once again, we can clean this up by letting the 6 slide into the vector and get nice vec uh, integer components. Or we could write it as 3 fifths, 4 fifths. And you recognize, perhaps, those components as being coordinates of a point on the unit circle, which you know must be true. This is a unit vector. So. We're going to end with a few slides on the polar form of a vector, and this is going to be a um, little bit of a journey here for a few slides, and just be patient, and you'll see what, where the polarness comes from. So suppose u is not the zero vector. Then we can write u as the norm of u times the reciprocal of the norm of u times u. It looks like a lot of sound and fury that doesn't get us anywhere, but actually we recognize the magnitude here and this is the normalization we were just working with a moment ago. And what's the normalization? It's a unit vector pointing in the same direction as u. We could write that rather cosmically as norm of u times the normalization of u. And we could call this the almost polar decomposition for reasons that will become clear in a slide or two. So let's look at an example. If we have the vector 5, 2, this is our vector u. The norm is easily calculated to be square root of 29, so we could rewrite u as square root of 29 times this vector, which is the normalization of u. That's our almost polar composition. So let's get more mileage out of this example and see why it's almost polar. We've got the length information, which is encoded in the norm. So we know that the length of this vector is about 5.39. And the direction information is obviously encoded in the normalization of u. It's pointing in the direction of u. Somehow the direction is, 
is, is encoded in this, in this unit vector. We're going to zoom in on the, on the unit circle here, and we'd like to get our hands on this theta. That would, that would be a, a nice quantitative way of describing the direction. What is this theta? Well, we are on the unit circle, so every point on the unit circle has coordinates cosine theta sine theta. And we need theta. We'll notice there are three ways to get theta in this picture. Cosine theta is 5 over root 29. So theta could be the arc cosine of 5 over root 29, or it could be the arc sine of 2 over root 29, or going back to the picture above, it could be the arc tangent of 2 over 5, being the rise of a run. It's the slope, it's, it's tangent of that angle theta. So we've got three different ways to calculate it, and in any case, you get 0.38 radians or about 21.8 degrees. So finally, we can answer the question, where is this polar form? Here's the almost polar form. And now we're going to substitute in the information from the previous slide. And you'll notice that this last form carries with it, in very prominent fashion, some information about this vector. It's got its length, which we call r, and this angle theta. Well, what is that information? That's exactly the information for the polar form, the polar coordinates of a point. So when you write a vector this way, I think it it's deserves the name polar form because you're basically giving the polar coordinates of a point. Now, you should be aware that the arc trig functions play funny games with you if you're not in the first quadrant. So let's look at an example. Here's a vector that lies in the second quadrant. Its norm is root 13, so its almost polar form looks like this. What is theta? Well, the arc cosine of negative 2 over root 13 is 123.7 degrees, which is the right answer. There's your theta. But if you try to apply the arc sine function, you get 56.3 degrees, roughly, which clearly is not the same, not the right answer. What's going on? Well, what's going on is, due to the nature of the arc sine function, it's picking among the infinite number of angles whose sine is 3 over root 13, one of them. And that one is 56.3 degrees. It's not the one we want, but it's closely related because it is basically the mirror image across the y-axis. So how could we recover the angle we actually want in this case? We could go 180 degrees counterclockwise and then move backwards 56.3 degrees. So we can use this information, even though it's not exactly what we want, we can use it to recover what we do want. A similar issue applies for arctangent. Arctangent is going to give you negative 56.3 degrees in this case, which is, once again, not what we want, but closely related. It's pointing in exactly the opposite direction of what we care about. So what you could do is go back 56.3 degrees and then go forward 180 degrees. And you'll notice that this is obviously the same algebraic uh, outcome as the previous line. We're just thinking about it slightly differently. In any case, th this is how you would get theta. So if you are not in the first quadrant, at least one of these arc trig functions is going to misbehave in the sense that it's not going to give you exactly what you want. So you just have to be aware of this issue when you try to find this theta.